I have Abel 1795, which is this collection of little faint fuzzy things in the middle here. So the centre of it is that relatively big bright blob, and the, but then actually most of these little orange, slightly fuzzy dots you can see are what make up Abel 1795. It is a cluster of galaxies, so each of those little fuzzy dots is a whole galaxy. And it's an enormous dis distance away, it's about a billion light years away. Amazing. Isn't it just, you know, it, this little faint smattering doesn't look like anything very much, but that's thousands of galaxies you're looking at there. They're all clustered around this one big bright galaxy in the middle. There's got to be stuff living in there. You would certainly think so, wouldn't you? That many galaxies, each with that many stars. We don't live in a rich cluster, we live in a poor group. So most galaxies don't live in complete isolation. A few do, but actually most live in groups. So maybe four, five, 10, 20 galaxies. The, the rare things are where you get thousands of galaxies all in one of these clusters. The Abel catalogue was put together in the 1950s by George Abel. There was a survey of the sky had been put together, I think called the Palomar Sky Survey. And he literally went through all the photographic plates by eye identifying objects like this. I think in his original catalogue there's getting on for 3,000 of these clusters that he found all across the sky, or the northern sky, because the, the survey he had actually only covered the northern sky. So they're all galaxy clusters? All clusters of galaxies. There was an extension uh, called the Abel Corwin uh, catalogue which did the southern hemisphere as well, so we now actually have these clusters all across the sky. So if you want a really long set of deep sky videos, you know, there's like two or 3,000 of these we can do. <laughs> And then you could do each galaxy within the cluster. Absolutely, yeah. yeah all right. <laughs> so here's a nice paper called MMTF H Alpha and HST FUV Imaging of the Filamentary Complex in Abel 1795. This is kind of a zoom in of the picture I showed you before. So actually the orangey stuff you can see here is exactly the same as the orangey stuff we were looking at before, but kind of zoomed in on that big bright galaxy in the middle. And then the pinky red stuff, that's this H Alpha emission. And then the blue stuff here is far ultraviolet emission. Both the H alpha emission and the far ultraviolet emission are a signature of young bright stars. So young stars, bright stars, heat up the gas which make it glow to produce the H alpha and then the stars themselves are actually so hot that they emit in the far, far ultraviolet. So this is actually the signature of star formation going on within this cluster. But you can see that the star formation is actually nothing to do with the galaxy. It's, you know, I mean, some of it's in the galaxy, but there's this whole strand of star formation going on out here. I mean, that's on a galactic scale, that filament. Yeah. And beyond, right? It's, it's bigger than the galaxy. So how is it that there's star formation going on, quite intense star formation going on, that's nothing at all to do with the galaxies? Somehow there has to be a whole load of gas that's been brought together to make stars outside the galaxy. But let's complete this multi-wavelength view of this cluster by looking in the X-ray part of the spectrum. So I have one, another paper here called A Very Deep Chandra Observation of Abel 1795. Chandra is an X-ray satellite, still currently doing its thing up there in space, and they pointed at it, Abel 1795, for a very long time. So here it is in X-rays, and it's a very bright X-ray source, so there's masses of X-rays coming out. And actually superimposed on top of it, the blue contours here are the H-alpha observations I was showing you before. So this is where that star formation is going on. The existence of the X-ray emission tells you there's a whole load of gas there, because the process by which X-rays are emitted is a thing called Bremsstrahlung which is breaking radiation, which is if you have a plasma, so you've got, if you just think about hydrogen gas to keep life simple, you've got a whole load of, once you've ionized it, you've got a whole load of protons and a whole load of electrons. The, the electrons are no longer bound to the protons because it's all been ionized, it's all been ripped up into this plasma. But once in a while, one of these electrons will go somewhere near one of the protons, and in the process, it may be decelerated, so it'll scatter past it and it'll lose energy. And as with a lot of processes in physics, when, that, when energy changes, the way you kind of make sure that energy is globally conserved is that a photon gets emitted. Now these are such energetic processes that this breaking process ends up producing X-ray photons. And the fact we see so many X-ray photons tells us there's a lot of hot gas there. So you can actually do a calculation of saying, okay, we've got all this X-ray emitting gas sitting there. How long would we expect it to stay there for? How long does it take to cool down? And that's a reasonably straightforward calculation to do because we can figure out how much energy is being lost through this Bremsstrahlung process, how much energy is going away in photons. And that, if you take that energy away, that means the gas kind of cools down over time. And if you make the gas dense enough, then the cooling time gets quite short, at least in astronomical terms. Um, so actually the gas, that hot X-ray emitting gas, stops being hot and X-ray emitting and cools down to a point where it turns back into normal hydrogen gas. And that's what we're seeing here in this tail. So here they've kind of, they've, they've taken this original X-ray image 
and kind of remove the smooth distribution of x-rays to see what's left. And if you remove that smooth distribution of hot gas, you find there is still x-ray emitting stuff on the scale of this H-alpha filament and actually lying in kind of the same place. When you see kind of an excess of x-ray emission, uh, like they found when they kind of subtracted off this smooth stuff, that's telling you that that's a place where the, the gas is particularly dense. And the fact that it's emitting more x-rays um, actually means it's going to cool down faster. So this feature is cooling down sufficiently quickly that some of it's just turned into normal hydrogen gas and some of that hyd normal hydrogen gas has now turned into stars. This is a thing called a cooling wake. It's gone all the way from being this hot, glowing, diffuse x-ray emitting gas all the way down to cooling down into clumps that then turn into stars. It must be something to do with the fact that this galaxy is moving through the core of the cluster. So you've got this hot x-ray emitting gas that permeates the cluster and then you've got this galaxy moving a bit relative to it, which means that actually it's kind of dragging a wake behind it, creating this wake behind it as it's moving of that cooling gas. That physics of figuring out the time scale on which gas cools down, you can apply it to any cluster of galaxies. And what you find is that the time scale for the central parts of clusters to cool down is relatively short. Remember I said that the the cooling time, how quickly it cools down, depends on the density squared. So actually if you go to the centre of the cluster where there's a whole load of gas, that means that its cooling time becomes quite short because those, these emission processes become strong. And in fact they become much shorter than the lifetime of the universe. So this effect that we see in this weird wake in Abel 1795, by a simple argument you should see the same phenomenon in every cluster of galaxies going on in the middle because the cooling time is sufficiently short that they should be turning into stars. And to some extent that's happening, but not anywhere near the extent we expected it to happen. And what that's telling us is that there's some process that's actually heating the gas back up again, stopping it from cooling down so that we end up with loads and loads and loads of stars forming. And it's thought that the process, the main process that's heating the gas back up again, is that at the centre of that massive galaxy in the middle, there's a supermassive black hole. That supermassive black hole once in a while becomes an active and it starts throwing out very energetic jets of material and so on. And that those jets of material smashing in to the gas that surrounds it heats it all back up again. So it's thought that the reason why you don't see phenomena like the one in Abel 1795 all over the place is that the, the clusters of galaxies themselves have their own heating mechanism to stop it from happening too much. If you look at clusters of galaxies, you actually find that, as well as that sort of diffuse X-ray emission, you actually find that there's optical light on large scales as well. There's this thing called intracluster light. And it's thought that is just stars that are permeating the cluster rather than living in individual galaxies. Now, for the most part, most of those stars are things that got ripped out of galaxies. So they probably just formed in, normally in a, in, a, in a galaxy. But that galaxy interacted with another galaxy. And as part of that process, some of the stars got kicked out into the cluster space. So most of that intracluster light is probably stars that started their lives in galaxies and then got kicked out. But at least some of it would have formed through processes like this. So those are stars that were never in a galaxy. There's something so romantic about stars not in a galaxy, I think. Like, I love the idea of those. It, yeah, it's a, it'd, be a sort of, it'd be a sad and lonely life, wouldn't it, really? Mm. And look, I know this probably isn't going to win any astrophotography awards, but here's Abel 1795, photographed by Professor Merrifield himself in his backyard in Nottingham with his beloved EV scope. And while I have your attention, can I take this opportunity to thank everyone who supports Deep Sky videos on Patreon. You can see them now, their names floating through space. Thanks everyone. You can join them by going to patreon.com slash deepskyvideos. I'll put a link in the video description.